Good morning, everybody. So um, today we're going to discuss insect pest management in, in turf. And I'd like to draw your attention. There are some folks that are aware of this, but um, others maybe not. Um, over the last year, we've, we've produced a flip guide. This is a pocket size, um, full color flip guide to turf pests. Um, good news is that we have it made and it's got a Virginia Tech um, or Virginia Cooperative Extension publication number and you could, you could download that. It's a PDF. Um, bad news is we're out of the hard copies. They, they kind of went like hotcakes, um, our first production of them. Uh, so we're looking to get um, maybe some sponsorship to uh, produce some more of these. This is about a you know three four dollar um, full color flip guide um, and you know, kind of web weatherproof and, and everything. So we we hope to get a number of these in stock so that extension agents and other uh, turf grass professionals can can order these. But just wanted to bring your bring your attention to that that we do have this this guide as an educational tool. So turf grass. Insect pest management um, really revolves around preventing this. And this is uh, white grub injury. You, you notice a lot of dieback, irregular patches, um, kind of centralized in, in certain areas, very spotty. And you also notice on the screen is something's kind of been digging up at that turf. So these are all kind of evidence of uh, very likely white grub injury to the turf. Um, a combination of things. So what are white grubs? I know most of you do. Uh, very, very common insect pests, both in the adult stage and the larval stage. But um, just a, a quick review, white grubs are the larval stage of scarab beetles. And scarab beetles are like the Japanese beetle we're all familiar with. Chafers, and there's, there's a number of other ones. And their immature stages all kind of take on a similar C-shaped grub. Uh, with a with a head capsule and they're all kind of creamy white colored um, very very similar looking all the all the scarab beetle larvae we have a number of different scarab beetles that could pop up in in virginia turf um, you see on the screen there a bunch of them including some of the the larger ones like the the, the green june beetle you'll definitely know that one when you see it um, so any of these could end up in our turf but primarily it's japanese beetle and and mass chafer in in most of the most of the cool season turf um, around the state of Virginia, they're probably 90% of the, of the white grubs you're gonna see. So in a basic white grub anatomy, we're not gonna dwell too much on, on this, but you know, just to not, not confuse a white grub with some other things, they have, they have a head capsule, it's pretty clear, pretty distinct, um, very, a lot harder than the rest of the body. Um, there will be three pair of legs, six total legs, there's the abdomen, which kind of comes off of after the legs. And on that abdomen at the, at the tail end is what's called the raster. Um, and that's real important for identifying the different grub species. There is, oops, there's a raster pattern on that that you see at the bottom and, and uh, several of our grubs that we have and, and how the spines and the, and the hairs can, can vary. Um, such as in the Japanese beetle, there's, there's kind of a little V-shaped that you, that you might see here. It is very difficult with the naked eye to see these. You need to use some magnification. Um, usually at least 10X can, can help you. And you clearly have to uh, clean them of, of soil and everything as well. But the big, big point is, um, is to know that it's a white grub and not something else. And here's examples of billbug larvae and weevil larvae. And you'll notice there are no legs. There's the head capsule, they're very similar in color but there's no legs. And that's the big separation of whether you have maybe one of these weevils or build bugs that are out there. And they're also a lot smaller. Um, but some of the early stages of white grubs are about the same size as these. Hello, and Kumar, is, there a, is it really important to be able to tell what type of white grub? Or, I mean, obviously pointing out the difference there with the, the weevils and those. So it is a big difference between those two, but is it really important that you get down to whether it's a mass chafer or a June beetle? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'll say yes and no to that one. For the most part, um, white grub management is, is very similar. So in a sense, it doesn't matter which one you have. Now, now where would it be a, a big issue? Well, we're going to get into the life cycles of some of these grubs. And the annual white grubs, which are the mass chafer and Japanese beetle, very, very... Uh, you know, distinct pattern, you know, you, you can go out on a certain 
certain week of the year and you'll know what, what life stage very likely you're going to have those grubs in. There's other grubs that have different, more complex life cycles, multiple generations a year, um, some that take um, you know, two to three years to develop. And in that sense, you, know, you, you could have all different life stages potentially of, of that one out there, which could affect control tactics. The other thing where it could be important is there's been some resistance to insecticides that has developed. It's not a huge issue with white grubs. Um, we'll, we'll get into another pest where that is, but in that sense, knowing that you have, say, Japanese beetle, for instance, that could potentially be resistant, it'd be important to know that you have that one and not maybe mass chafer, which is a little easier to kill. But very, very good question. I don't know if that came from you, Whitney, or from no, someone else writing in. Excellent question. So. Okay, just a, a little bit of the damage that they do. They're they're really they're they're root feeders feeding in that that uh, thatch, you know, root area, um, and and they just trim back roots, um, and they're just devouring the the uh, the root systems of the plant, which can show itself in you know a plant that's basically lost the ability to pull in nutrients and and, and water. So they just have dieback in certain areas. Um, and a lot of times this shows up late in the season. It's when the grubs get larger and really cause a lot of damage. So this is kind of very likely fall, fall damage that you're seeing right here on this, on this tee box. Um, if you pull up that, that turf, you should probably find grubs below and the turf should pull up pretty easily because they've basically eaten the root system that, that hold it in, in, in place. The other evidence is there's things that can find white grubs better than humans can. And these are the animals that eat them like skunks. Um, and they will, if you have enough grubs, you know, maybe 10 per square foot, these things can, can sniff that out. And it's, you know, it, it, um, it's very beneficial to them to dig up that turf. They've got, they've got dinner waiting for them right, right underneath and they know it. So often heavy white grub problems, you'll also see skunk damage digging up. You'll also see moles mole tunnels um, because they are also things that are feeding on on these white grubs. So these are all symptoms of of white grub injury. Okay, the white grubs that we have, Japanese beetle, just quick uh, glimpse at its history here. Obviously the name would suggest it did not originate in the U.S. It's an invasive species from the early 1900s, um, came into the uh, northeastern U.S. and has basically you know, made its way all across the eastern U.S., you know, all the way through Virginia. Um, it's not gone very far west um, of the Mississippi River, but there are patches of it that are popping up. But it's an invasive species that, you know, California does not want, for instance. There would be a quarantine if it was, if it was found. Um, but we deal with it year in and year out in Virginia, as most of you know. And here's the other one, Mass Chafer. Um, I was surprised when I first got into turf entomology that I'm finding a lot more of these. I assumed, based on what I read, it was predominantly Japanese beetle, but I started doing turf and I found out it's not. It's primarily this one, at least in the turf grass that I work with um, in this end of the state. Thing is, their biologies are very similar. Um, their, their, their life cycles are, are very similar. The, the adults, maybe mass chafer emerges a little bit earlier um, as an adult, but they follow a similar life cycle, which I'm going to show you. And we have both northern and southern mass chafer, very, very similar insects. And here is the life cycle. So basically, this time of year, we have grubs of varying sizes. They're, they're basically growing up from first, first instar, second instar, and that's basically um, an instar is a molt. And they will, they will go through multiple molts and until they reach their, their maximum size as a larva late, late in the fall. And that's when they start to migrate deep in the soil. So right now we have grubs of various sizes and it's actually a really good time to try to kill them because of that. They're up near the surface feeding and they're, a lot of them are smaller. So they are easy targets right now. Um, you wait a little bit later in the fall and they're going to be larger and they're going to be deeper. They're going to be harder to kill. Um, so that's basically their, their life cycle. You do also see a few adults still around like Japanese beetles and still laying eggs. Um, it's, it's possible they're, these are real, real late eggs being deposited, but they're still out there. So the one thing I wanted to point out with this life cycle is, you know, where they are most susceptible, and I kind of mentioned it already. So when eggs are first laid, these, these young larvae need to feed and they're, they're at the surface. 
very susceptible to uh, to drenches. You don't need to penetrate as, as deeply to uh, kill these larvae. So what to use to control them? There's a plethora of insecticide options out there. Um, this isn't even all of them. This is just a, a snippet of some of the more popular ones that are, that are out there. We've, uh, we've gone through the years of what is the popular insecticides. Um, it used to be diazinon and some of these um, organophosphate compounds like Dersban, diazinon, those, those were the most common ones in the 1990s um, prior to the neonicotinoids. Now it's things like merit imidacloprid, which is a neonicotinoid, and um, various versions of, of homeowner products that, that have the same active in ingredients as the neonicotinoids. And I'll get into some of these other ones as we, as we go along. But so you have all these options out there, different insecticides that, that you could use. So what goes into the decision making? Um, obviously, it doesn't pay to put anything down if it doesn't work. Um, that's a complete loss of money. So it's got to work, and cost clearly comes in for, for almost everybody. Um, and cost is relative. If you've got a really, um, if you've got a golf course you're maintaining, and, and it's you know it's going to cost you a lot if that if that turf starts to go down on you. Well, then cost is a little bit different than you have a you know a huge lawn and it's back in the far corner where no one goes. Um, you know, cost cost isn't as as you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be paying for the more expensive insecticides for, for that area, for that type of turf. So um, the other thing is, are there different insect pest groups that are out there that you need to control? Um, so these are all factors that, that can get, go into it. The other thing with chemical control of, of white grubs and other turf pests is you're gonna take a preventative approach or a curative approach. And these are, these are two ways of, of dealing with, with pests. Um, they have their pros and cons. And we'll basically get into what preventive is. It's, it's basically putting something down, you know, just in case. It's insurance. Um, there's obviously some, some advantages here. If, if you go with a preventative tactic, you can basically schedule when this is going to go down. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's when there's more rainfall, a chance to water it into the root zone. So we're talking springtime. Times when uh, there's not as much human traffic on the on the turf because you don't want to schedule it during then as well. Um, so there's a lot of, and also some of the insecticides you, you use can be quite selective. Um, and one of the biggest drawbacks is is cost. These preventative approaches is is going to cost you in two ways. One, the types of products that can be there long enough that are systemic. Um, are probably going to cost you more than the than the cheaper products that can give you a quick knockdown kill, um, and it also may be expensive in the sense that when you're using insurance and preventive c control, you don't know whether you're going to have a pest problem. So you could be putting a lot of insecticides down that are un, un, unwarranted, um, and you know, in the sense that's that's loss of loss of uh, money. Now, do these so, typically though kind of go back to the same place, like? Some some things kind of like they hatch from there, so they go back yeah, to there. Very, Is that true of them? It's a uh, in a sense that so the grubs are going to start from a beetle laying eggs, and there are um, ovipositional preference areas and spots in the field. So what would a Japanese beetle, for instance, want to lay its eggs in? Well, you know the soil needs to be moist, so maybe it's an area of the field that's a little stays a little moister. Um, there's other plants around, surrounding plants that the adults can, can be feeding on. Um, you know, Japanese beetles obviously like roses. That we see them all over the kudzu. So, you know, I see that right around all over Virginia is a big kudzu patch. Well, Japanese beetles could be in there and the, the turf could be right next to it. Um, and they definitely sense out certain areas to lay their eggs. So it's not uh, insects that are there year in and year out. It's the fact that beetles keep coming back to that area because it's it's kind of optimal for So it's not that that's eggs. where they were hatched from, it's more that the, the area that they um, generally come from attracts them again because of yeah, the Yeah, because of the properties, right. And they also like sandier soils. So if you're around an area that's got you know heavier clay soils, but you've built up a golf course, for instance, where there's some sand coming down on the beetles will be drawn to that to, to lay their eggs. The, the grubs do better in there. They can move better in, in sandier soils. Um, higher or, or, or organic matter is another thing. Um, so 
Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, it tends to be that it's because it's a good site for beetles to lay eggs. So you can to kind of watch their patterns over time and if it's something that becomes a major problem where you are, then a preventative might be a good bet or a good use of your money in those kind of instances. In those areas, like They right. always lay eggs right Exactly, here. perfect. So you know it's a problem area, that would be a, a wise decision to put, put one down, whereas other areas you never see them, well then why put a preventative down? Yep, very, very good, Whitney. So. This is, uh, these are some of the older products. I just wanted to kind of take you back in time and, and um, you know, we, the neonicotinoids are really getting beat up, um, you know, for them being the uh, dangerous compounds. But if you really knew what they re replaced, you would really, really know that they're a lot safer as far as vertebrate toxicity um, from the products that we used to use, the organophosphates. Um, there's a reason that they're, they've been taken away um, and lost their registrations. So there's definitely been a move to the neonicotinoids starting in the mid 1990s. Um, Merit was one of the first. Imidacloprid, you've got thiamethoxam products like Meridian, Clothianidin, which is a arena. Donatefuron has got various labels, Xylam being one of them, um, several others. So these are there's a there's a bunch of products, and the imidacloprid has several generic versions of it as well. Um, there's just a slide showing a few imidacloprid products that are out there. Um, just just Google, Google it, you'll find all kinds of things you can buy right over the internet. Um, homeowner products, you know, more, more commercial, you know, more concentrated, um, but they're all imidacloprid and they all, they all work. Another instance, just like other pesticides, where when they go off patent, you can find generics of that particular active ingredient that are also just as effective and have a better price point. Yeah, absolutely. And and usually when one goes generic, it brings the price of everything down because you need to you need to be able to compete. So, um, but you know, clearly over the over the last five to ten years, we have seen some issues with the neonicotinoids. Um, you know, some uh, some issues that have popped up with with bee kills. So these have uh, more so than not been been uh, you know off off label uses mistakes that were made um, and you know bees bees have been killed because of it um, and you know what it's done has caused us to take a closer look at what these things can can be doing in the environment and in particular to to pollinators so what you see on all neonicotinoids is a pollinator protection um, spot a little box that kind of tells you the, uh, how toxic it is and, and you know, advising you on, on how to use it to, to uh, minimize bee kills. For instance, in turf grass, you have a lot of clover that can pop up and um, that is a common place for bees to be foraging and, and uh, putting a neonicotinoid down when they're out foraging on that you know, could, could result in a lot of bee kills. <clears throat> so the other thing to keep in mind if, with uh, white grubs is it's normal to find grubs on on any turf. Um, it's it's not an insect that when it shows up you got trouble. It's when a lot show up um, in in pretty high densities, and you know the turf is is suffering from some other things as well that it that it can basically you know, start to show symptoms of uh, of this root root feeding. So it's not just the, the mere presence. It's it's density. Um, how many white grubs are out there that, that really cause these problems. And there's thresholds that have been developed. It's about eight, eight grubs per square foot. You start to show some symptoms on, on most turf grass. Now, is there gonna be a difference between warm season versus cool season turf? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Kumar, with reference to that? Yeah, there's, um, you mean the response to injury? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, they tend to be, I mean, I deal with them more on the on the cool season grasses. So that what I said with the eight is based on cool season grass threshold. I really don't know the response of of some of the warm season grasses, whether it's it's lesser or higher. It's, it's well, I, I would argue a lot of that is is that so you look at the life cycles of the two. The um, cool season grass is in its most stressed time when they're feeding, so it makes That's, them a lot more prone to showing problems from drought or whatever because they don't have the root system whereas that is the most active growth time 
for the, the warm, warm season, season grasses. Yeah. So they're going to recover their fruit base and they're going to be probably a little bit more drought tolerant. And so it, just, just the nature of those two grasses, the, the damage that is done by the grubs is going to um, show more effect in the cool season turf. That, that makes complete sense. That's very good input. So I wanted to kind of, um, and I'm, I'm going to lead into my next slide with this one, but just the inspiration of where the neonicotinoids um, came from, and it was from the mode of action of, of nicotine, you know, which is obviously we, we get from plants, tobacco in this case, um, and how it acts on the nervous system, the nicotinic receptors. And basically they, they took that, and that's a very toxic compound, nicotine, nicotine sulfate, um, extremely toxic. And, and the neonicotinoids are, are far less toxic, and, and they've, they've um, that's basically the inspiration of the, of the neonicotinoids, is a much safer version of, of nicotine. Um, now there's another plant-derived compound that kind of leads to the other more popular turf grass insecticide today. Um, so this is the Ryania plant, and it's, it's from South America, and it produces alkaloids that affect the ryanidine receptors. Um, on insects, and that's basically a muscle poison. It affects your ability to contract muscles. So this plant that produced that alkaloid led to the development of the um, the diamide insecticides, and acelaprin, which is chlorantranilprol, is is one of the first that have come along. And some of the some of the attributes of this one, it's very long lasting in the soil, um, which makes it a very good preventive insecticide extremely safe to mammals. They don't even know the, the level of toxicity. They've tested as high as they can go. Um, we don't have the same ryanidine receptors. It basically goes right through mammals. Um, and it's also very safe on natural enemies as well. So it's got a lot of um, good, good attributes. Another group of insecticides are these insect birth regulators. Um, a product called Mach 2 has um, halophenazide in it, which acts as a molting hormone mimic. So insects have to molt, and there's a hormone that triggers that molting, and that's ectosone. So this mimics that. So basically it causes a, a young grub to molt before it's time, and when it does that, it dies. So it, it uh, basically just causes them to shed their exoskeleton and die before they were supposed to. Um, so you know, kind of an innovative way to kill immature insects, um, and it works very well. So, so that would be, and you cannot use that as a preventative though, does it hang around long You enough? can, okay. you can, yeah. Um, you wanna kind of get it though when there's, when there's young, young grubs out there, but it, it can be used as a preventive. Just, I'll, I'll get into some of the efficacy with that. So, you know, those are some of the, some of the products that can be put down as preventive, and I'm gonna just basically show some, some trials and some summaries of, of some, some trials. So this was one from the, the late Dr. Youngman, 2011 down in Taswell, uh, Taswell Country Club uh, down there ran a, they had white grub issues and they ran a trial and they basically had 19 grubs per square foot, which is, that's pretty good pressure. And this just shows you products put down in the springtime as a preventive, 20th of April in this case, um, really the, the neonicotinoids not, not cutting it. Um, we might have knocked back grubs a little bit, but, but not significantly, um, versus there's your acelaprin in April, and basically no grubs come, come the uh, fall. So that's just, just an example of, of uh, you know, where maybe, maybe the acelaprin can give you a little bit better activity as a preventive. Um, all of these products work well when they're put down in the summertime, when those grubs are real susceptible. So anything can work well then. So you might as well go with the cheaper products. We ran a trial this, this year at the Turfgrass Research Center. Um, and we basically infested plots with beetles to lay their eggs to have the grubs. Um, and we did this when the beetles were active in June. And we put preventive insecticides down in, in May. And really all of them gave us pretty good grub control when we, when we dug up grubs in, in August, right before the field day they had. Um, and you know, here all of these worked with a with a May application. So you know, that's two two trials done right here in Virginia. There was a paper that came out that summarized 
trials done all over the uh, northeastern U.S. Um, and looking at some some products and and months that they were put down and low rates and high rates or low rates mid rates high rates and just showing you you know how how these performed over all these trials. It's a really good really good slide summarizing this is it. Japanese beetle. If I'm reading the yeah. bond correctly. And, now, is there a and some mass chafer data in okay, there as so well. So it's, a bit yeah. now, other than if you actually have a um, resistance problem, is there a difference in the efficacy between the two? Um, mass chafer and Japanese beetle? No. So the only problem you would have is it's a resistance problem. Right. There. Yeah. But but these are going to get these are going to get get all these. So. One of the one of the things I wanted to show is that um, you know some of these products like Dilox, you know that's not one you want to put down as a preventative in July to prevent damage in the fall. Whereas if you wait till the fall, you know as a as a curative, you're you're getting a lot better efficacy. Things like a Celeprin, ninety five percent even with the springtime application. So. Now these are percent control. The other right. ones that you were showing were actually numbers. Counts. Numbers of so reps, in this yeah. case, a higher, higher is better. Yeah, yeah. Percent percent control. Thanks for pointing that out. So you know, there's there's these summaries that are out there, but the bottom line is you've got you know, you've got products that can work as a preventive. Now moving into curative. So what is this? This is after you realize you have a grub problem. You know, what what are you going to go with? Well, at that point, you can hit them with some quick knockdown insecticides that, that aren't going to last long, but you don't need them to. They're, so, they're so gonna, we're talking about something like this time of year, yes. August to September. Yeah. You can use a curative at this point. So, you know, products like Seven, the old, uh, the old Seven that's been around for, for ages, um, still work well as a curative insecticides. Things like Dilox, um, these, you know, an organic phosphate that's, that's still around, um, that does have low mammalian toxicity. Um, acephate's another one, an organic phosphate, and then pyrethroids like Tallstar. So all these will, will get the job done if you can get it into the root zone. Um, you're going to kill grubs with all these. They're contact poisons. So what are some advantages of, of this one? Well, you can really spot treat, you know, only if you need it and you start to see the damage. Um, so that ends up being cheaper. The, the products are cheaper than the previous ones that I've talked about. Um, some of the issues though is it might be too late. You, you might have completely missed it and you've got some serious grub problems and, and you know, which will show damage on that turf. They basically killed it in some of those spots and now you've got to deal with that. So that's, that's one of the biggest one. And the other one is trying to treat it this time of year is, can be difficult. You know, if it was a football field, it'd be really hard to be keeping humans off of that turf when they need to be on that turf. Um, you know, for a practice quite quite frequently. So it's not an opportune time to be putting an insecticide down, um, but it is to kill the grubs. Um, so, you know, those were, those are the insecticides and really white grubs are, are a major driver of insect control, but there are other things out there. Um, in some more Southern areas, you've got chinch bugs, you've got some areas where you've got various weevils and bill bugs that can build up and, and some lepidopteran pests that can, you can have outbreaks. Um, fall army worms and things like that. And, and they can wipe out some turf. Yes, they can if uh, uh, in, in outbreak situations. Um, so, you know, that whole idea that there could be more than grubs out there, it could affect what insecticide you, you choose. Um, a lot of these lepidopteran pests, sod webworms, um, your, your, your fall army worms that can come late, um, sometimes even cut worms. Some of the neonicotinoids, well, I'll just say neonicotinoids are not very good for these. So your, your merit and others, that's not going to get them. They have products that have a pyrethroid included with them, or you can just throw in a pyrethroid in the tank mix and um, knock out all these, these lepidopteran pests. And pyrethroids tend to be pretty cheap. Um, and what are pyrethroid? By the, by the way, also inspired from a plant-derived compound Pyrethrins, which came from chrysanthemum flowers. So these are a little bit different nerve poison, um, but some of their traits are low mammalian toxicity and very fast knockdown. It will kill you within within a couple hours or at least. This is severe. the same compound that is on dog collars, for instance, for fleas, correct? Yeah. Well, and 
you know, neonicotinoids are in the, uh, the other flea and tick thing that preventive you can put on your dogs and cats. So all these things you can put on mammals. Um, it's a very, very good point. But now we're getting into that is something else you may want to keep in mind with selecting your, your, your chemical control. How am I on time? Let me... Okay. Is some of these non-target concerns. And this is, this is very personal. Um, it's also could be based on, you know, your, your clientele that you're serving with the turf. Um, but things that you clearly need to keep in mind is, is what else you could be killing by, by putting that thing down. You don't want to endanger humans at all um, with what you're doing. And there's also a lot of things that people care about. Pollinators are on, high on the list right now that um, you don't want to see a bunch of dead bees on your, on your golf course. Um, that's, that, could, that could be some problems, especially for the bees. <clears throat> there's also things that maybe some people don't even think about. Um, there's a lot of beneficial insects and other arthropods running around that play a key role in really uh, cycling nutrients, cycling uh, litter on top of the turf, down into the soil, eating other insects, including the grubs, um, earthworms, which aerate the soil. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of organisms that, that, that play a big, big role in, in turf and keeping it healthy. And you don't want to be killing them. There's a, there's some parasitoids that that develop on white grubs. They lay their eggs on them and their babies will, will kill the grub and, and feed on it. Um, this tophia wasp right here, we have this in Virginia. It's a big Japanese beetle parasitoid. And this one, very common right now, flying around turf, very beautiful, uh, the blue wing wasp. Um, this thing's flying around over turf looking for white grubs and it will, it will sting them, paralyze the grub, and there it'll lay its egg and the larvae will basically eat the grub and um, will kill the grub. It'll never become a beetle. So these things are out there doing their thing. You don't want to be killing them. They're kind of on your, on your side. <clears throat> so this is another advantage of like a celeprin or the, or the diamide insecticides. There's, there's virtually no negative effects on these beneficial arthropods. They're going to just get their target, white grubs. Also going to get those lepidopteran pests like armyworms, sod webworm, um, but not get the ones that you want to keep around. This is another but, instance where threshold really makes a difference, like having a little bit in there to help um, keep sustain keep, the natural enemies. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sustain the nat thank you, sustain the natural yeah. enemies, and then also you're not throwing other things out of balance. Yeah, that is uh, excellent, Whitney. That's a that's a really good point. Um, Leaving a few out there is 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 a really good thing. You keep because you'll the those parasitoids would crash if there were zero white grubs around. There would be nothing for them to survive on. Um, so getting into earthworms, this is a uh, you know, most people want to want to keep earthworms. You know, keep their soil healthy, keep it aerated. Um, others like on a putting green, <laughs> sometimes that can be an issue uh, when certain earthworms, which have Invasive ones that we have basically are, uh, you know, creating this on your putting green. That could be an issue. So, the whole um, toxicity of earthworms could take could mean different things for for different people. Um, we, we we basically tested some of the more popular insecticides that we have out there. A graduate student, Sudan Giawali, um, and these were Canadian night crawlers. Um, you know, real real common earthworm that we have in our systems, and this is the average mortality that we had um, drenched at what a grower would, would put down on, on turf. And you see just, you know, two of them really jumping out, Merit, Imidacloprid, and, and, and Xylam, uh, the uh, Dinotephuron, being very toxic. I mean, it killed virtually 100% of the earthworms and some of these other products having very little mortality on them. So just interesting to know that there's you know, you'll, you'll, you'll kill different levels of earthworms with these different insecticides. So what are some things that um, may be taking a different approach? You know, the biopesticides, these may be options for organic systems where you don't want to put any kind of synthetic insecticide out. Milky spore was one that was popular in the 90s. Um, and it's a, it's a bacillus bacteria. And really the research that I have read on it, it there's been far more control failures. There have been laboratory studies that show that it worked really well. 
and maybe a couple field studies, um, enough to that this became a product and they sold a lot of it. Um, but really the research shows it, it just, it, really it fails. Very inconsistent and, uh, and probably not, not worth the investment in, uh, in uh, trying it. Um, in the big pig paper right there in 1995, but a Dan Potter um, and a Redmond kind of summarized some of that. So what are some other options? Well, there's enema pathogenic fungi that you basically can buy in products. Here's one that's metarhizium anisoplier, which is, causes a, a green disease on the, on the larvae when they get infected with, this, with these fungal spores. And Bouveria, the one on the left here, creates these white um, hyphae from the, from the fungal infection. Pretty nasty way to go. The fungus basically devours you. Um, and they're, they're very effective on the, on the grubs if the environmental conditions are right. Moist soil, moist conditions. Um, it activates these fungi. And um, you know, they do actually work really well. <clears throat> now here was a an insecticide test that we did on the Virginia Tech golf course, Sudan Giawali, and Botanigard is Bouveria, Met F22 is your Menorizium, and it didn't work. Those alone did not work um, as compared to even a half rate of merit and, and a celebrin. Like they, they just could not even stand up. This is par for the course for a lot of these biopesticides. You can show it work and then you, you try it again in the field and you just get control failures. It's it's very inconsistent with them. Well, um, for them, the, the, the conditions have to be right for right. them to grow as well. Yes. So it's mm. it, not only is it the right conditions for the grub to be out, but it's also the right conditions for the right. biopesticide to actually Perfect. be active. And the timing's got to be right on for both of them uh, to, to work well. Now, there's been a little bit better results with field trials with nematodes, enema pathogenic nematodes. You see three different products right here, all three different nematodes. And what you buy are a brick, basically, or a block of infected juvenile worms. And they're kind of dried out. And when they're placed in water, it activates them. And they basically come to life and start moving. And you could have a billion infected little juveniles that you've basically put down in the soil and they are going to be searching for white grubs to infect. And when they do, they will propagate and basically kill that larva. And now, that, I know the answer to this, but just in case, these are not the type that will actually attack the plant. Yes, yes, because, they, You know, nematodes can be a problem in turf, but that is not what these are. Very, very good point. Yeah, they're, they're very specific uh, to insects, enema pathogenic. Um, they're, they will get all grubs and they will also get cut worms and lepidopterin, but it needs to be a soft bodied insect crawling around in the soil. And that's the only thing it's gonna kill. So here's just a trial. These are all different nematodes you see on the left and then a, uh, an insecticide organic phosphate and just showing you, again, you know, it's a little bit of control, but you know, not as good as an insecticide most of the time. Um, nematodes, you need soil moisture as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I talk about one other insect pest that's making, making the news in Virginia, annual bluegrass weevil. So turf grass management, really white grubs have been the driving force, but in some areas where protecting annual bluegrass and maybe some bent grass that um, is, is grown near it. And the, this insect um, is basically invasive. It's, it's moving through Virginia, you know, can, can be a really big deal. Uh, why is this, you know, such an important pest. Well, one larva can, can kill a uh, grass plant and there could be a, you know, densities exceeding 450 larvae per square foot um, that can build up. So the numbers can build up tremendously. It's a tiny insect. You can see the basic size of it on someone's hand right there. Um, it's a weevil. These are snouted beetles. And again, there's, there's no legs on the, on the larval stages. Um, and it's very patchy where it is in Virginia. It tends to be on golf courses. Um, it tends to be where you're going to have annual bluegrass cut short. It's a pest of, of real, real short, short turf grass. And eggs are de deposited in the leaf sh shaft right there. You can see them. When they hatch out, the, the larvae will feed inside the stem. And then they eventually they get too, too big and they move into the crown. And that's where they basically can, can kill it. 
at that point. So you can have dead patches where you have this annual bluegrass and then even bent grass showing some uh, damage. And it's really big deal on, on a lot of golf courses. Um, and it's been a big deal in, in New York and New Jersey. Um, and they've been dealing with this, this insect a lot longer than we have. So it's very complicated. The control, there's multiple generations, adults and larvae. Basically, it's a season-long pest. Adults will emerge at different times. You see the first one's kind of coming out right, or, right around when dogwood, dogwoods are blooming. Uh, that's your first, first adults. Then you're going to have another adults in late June to July, and then another one around this time in August. So you've basically gone through three generations, um, maybe even more in Virginia. Um, so how do you search for these? You can use a, a soap, soap and water drench that'll kind of irritate them and bring them up to the surface where, where you can see them a lot better. They're small beetles and the adults move. So they may be in leaf litter during the winter and they'll move into the, the uh, annual bluegrass um, in the springtime. Tom, so, we have a question. When sure. beetles develop resistant to agents, does that apply to both the larva and the adult? Yes. Well, you use different different insecticides to uh, kill them anyway. So you're you're probably gonna, as you see on here, well, conserve and provant are, are two things. But once you have resistance, you don't want to use that, that that product. Period. Regardless what life stage um, has has shown that. But so this is a little bit older slide that, that came from Albert Copen, Copenhofer. There's some other insecticides I'm going to get into. But the bottom line is there's guidelines out there. Um, to kill these. Pyrethroids were the basically the old standby uh, because they were cheap, because you could use them as adulticides. The problem is resistance has developed to pyrethroids, and it may not be everywhere, but using them may not work, and that's where you got to rotate your chemistries, um, keep resistance down. Um, so, you know, here's some insecticides we haven't talked about yet. Provant in doxycarb is one that... Uh, We'll get the job done on both larvae and adults. Conserve, which is spinosad, um, another different different type of in class of uh, insecticides that works really well. And here's here's one that's only about two years old. It's called Ferens. This is a diamide like a celeprin is, but it's got a little broader spectrum, pest spectrum, and it's very very good on. It's probably the best material out there on annual bluegrass weevil, and. It, provides season long control. So you can put it down early and basically move systemically in the plant. You can kill both, both life stages. <clears throat> it's expensive though, so that's your trade off. Um, but in areas where you need to protect your annual bluegrass, it would be a you know, possible one to use. I also failed to mention this weevil track. Um, if you do, if you're very interested in this or have issues with it, um, Syngenta has the, the Weevil Track system, which is a network of entomologists and other uh, golf course superintendents that basically are, are writing little blogs about what they're seeing with this with this insect. So you can basically learn from what they're what they're doing, what they're seeing, um, when these things are active, um, and it's basically a whole network of of keeping track of what's going on with this. And Virginia is kind of in its infancy right now, joining this because we really haven't had this insect for 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 too long, but it's it's really popping out big time. So um, just wanted to draw your attention to that. And that's, that's really all I have. I wanted to save some time for, for any questions. If Please use the Q&A or the chat box to send any questions you might have. And while we're waiting for that, I just wanted to go through some of the summaries that, you know, hopefully you kind of learn that there's a lot of factors that, that, affect your decision making in, in pest control and in turf. So you got to just take all that into consideration. Um, each person has their own reason for controlling the, the insects and um, you know hopefully you giving you a lot of things to think about and, and uh, options that are out there. And you know white grubs still are kind of our major driver. So if you're controlling them you're really taking care of most of your, your turf grass issues. Neonicotinoids, the celeprin, Mach 2, you know, keep that in mind as preventive, curative. There's a lot of cheaper products that you can you can go with. Um, and the whole annual bluegrass weevil is a completely different ballgame. Um, 
little, little, it's a lot more com complex with timing of your insecticides and, and everything like that. So. Which that one, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name, but the uh, same class of- Oh, Ferenc? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Now that one, it, it allows you to not have to worry about the timing as much, correct? You just have to pay for that. Right, I think once you know you have them, you can put that down and, and it should provide you season long. Now the, the mode of action with those, since they are, um, you know, obviously they're, they're a product that's probably going to be used a lot, the celeprin and, and that because of their broad spectrum, their long season control, their mode of action, is it one that is um, highly likely to develop yes. resistance? Unfortunately, yes, uh, so because it's, they're long lasting. Um, it means that they're out there for a, for a long time, which means if you go through multiple generations, you could select for resistance. That is a big threat with that class of chemistry. It's got a lot of positive attributes. But the, so it's a poster child for making sure you rotate chemistry. Yes, very good. Very good suggestion. Should you treat the grub before aeration? When would aeration go on in the fall usually? Typically. That's, and it, so aeration is kind of a, it can be in the spring, it can be in the fall. It's when your turf can recover from it. And it all depends on how much uh, surface area you remove. But typically, especially in sports, they're going to aerate in the fall. And I think to some extent, golf courses as well. And it, again, it depends on the species they're aerating. You're going to aerate earlier for warm season turf and more likely in the fall for cool season. So that's, if you're treating for grubs, it's more likely in cool season. So. Yeah, I would say, uh, so the, the later you wait in the fall, the grubs are gonna be larger and they're gonna move, move down deeper in the soil. So my guess is you would need to, if, if you're gonna be putting something down because you have an issue, that would need to go down a little earlier uh, to be more effective, which would probably precede the aeration. Um, well, there's also a concern, like if you talk about a pre-emergence herbicide that you kind of break the barrier, so to speak, and that's not really a concern here, no. right? Because it's, it's going to be in that layer of the soil and they're feeding on the plants right. and yeah. um, so that you don't have to worry about that aspect. So but, but, you know, I was just thinking about it. I mean, I, I guess the aeration holes could help get it down with, with penetration. Now that I think about it, like that's going to definitely give a lot of entry points for the for it to move in. Um, that's a really good question. I'm actually going to look into whether there's been a recommendation of, of uh, insecticides being a lot more effective or you don't need as much watering in if it's following aeration. Because it, it'll still get in the soil solution yeah. easier, potentially. Yeah. Is there much division in groups of products in who should be using the insecticides, homeowner versus commercial applicators? So are there, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is there much of that that is restricted um, to a commercial you know, applicator where a homeowner would not be able to purchase those products? You mean some of these insecticides? Mm -hmm. um, well, some of it's a cost thing. Uh, clearly the neonicotinoids like, so Merit would be the, the commercial turf and then you'd have like bare, you know, some, some bare product that, you know, or other. It comes off of the box store Yeah, shelf. yeah. Those both will, will get the job done if you're putting the active ingredient out at the right rate. Um, you know, it's probably more expensive in the long haul for the homeowner to be buying that much compound, but they don't need to buy it in quite the quantities. Some products you're never going to have a home, like Ferentz, I think the cost right now and the amount that they would have to buy it in is not something that they're going to go out and buy for, um, you know, it's not even a something that they would be getting a hold of. Your pyrethroids, they have both homeowner and commercial and both of those, both of those work. Um, so a lot of them are general use insecticides that both homeowners can get. Um, you don't need the pesticide license. Organic phosphates you do. Uh, so yeah, it's a, that's a good, good question. Some of them, it's just the sheer cost of it that you're probably not going to have a homeowner getting that. Well, and it, it, it's two things, the cost of the per unit of product and most of the time they're not packaged in right. such that, a way. That was what I was meaning, like, like Ferenc, I doubt they have a, a small container of that, that that would be 
And, and you know, we run into that some with, for instance, herbicides. There's some that there's nothing that prevents a homeowner from using them, but the smallest bottle is six, eight hundred dollars, and it's exactly. enough to treat five acres. Yeah. You're not going to buy that for your two thirds of an right. acre. But it's still general use, and if they could get their hands on it, they could use it. Yeah, that's it's the same for insecticides, except that you know a lot of the ones that are going to work there's homeowner versions of it right now. So there's there's not really issues as much as some of the weed, so some of the herbicides that, you know, there's really only a certain one that's gonna get a certain kind of weed situation. Insects, you, you kind of have the products. Well, and they, they also, you know, just remember the law, the label is the law. So as far as re-entry periods and when to apply, and you have all of the B labels, just making sure that you are applying them as they are recommended to be applied. Absolutely, yeah.